The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It is wonderful to pause this holiday weekend to offer God our worship, our thanks, and our praise. We are in the second week of a three-week worship series about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we're pairing that with some amazing words from our Presbyterian Constitution called the Great Ends of the Church that describe what it means to be disciples together as a group, as a church. This afternoon, our presbytery is giving us a wonderful opportunity, a justice concert. The concert will have originally created music, art, and dance by people from all of different churches in our presbytery. It's at 2 p.m., and the information, the link on how to get to that concert is in the email that Ava sent out on Thursday. So you can check there, or you can check on the Presbytery of New Brunswick uh, website. This holiday weekend, our Mission and Justice and Peacemaking Committee wanted to be sure that you have some resources in your hands since we can't gather together as a community or even as a congregation this year, wanted you to have some resources to help you think and pray about racial reconciliation and all of the reminders and the call that we have this Martin Luther King weekend. So I hope that you will avail yourself of those resources. And similarly, our local clergy group, since we couldn't plan a joint service this year, Several of the clergy have offered prayers or found some resources from their own traditions that are being sent out, have been sent out. You should have received that from Ava as well. So find some time this weekend to turn your hearts and your prayers toward justice and peacemaking. Yesterday, we had a prayer time in the courtyard of the church. It was a time set aside to pray for our country, pray for a peaceful transfer of power, pray for hearts and minds to be healed, praying for all those who are sick with COVID and praying for those who are grieving the loss of folks and praying for all those who are in the battle fighting to try to make our country healthy and safe again. It was a beautiful time of prayer. If you weren't able to be there, I hope that you will lift up similar prayers on your own. Each February, our deacons send out care packages of treats and messages of love to our college students and to students who are young adults who might be working or living at home. We can't grab little hearts this year while we're enjoying coffee during fellowship time. So we're asking folks to make financial contributions. And you can do that by sending a check to the church with a memo that says college care packages. Or you can use the regular Donate Now button on our website and just similarly note that you'd like to support our college care package ministry. I know the young adults really appreciate being remembered and prayed for and having a little support. Next week, we will worship at 1015 on Sunday morning using the Zoom platform. We've chosen that platform instead of live streaming here from the sanctuary because next Sunday is when we will ordain and install officers. And part of that is them making vows, taking vows before us and before God. And it just seems best to be able to see each other and hear these folks make their profession of faith as they take vows. So 10:15. Next week on Zoom, and then we'll return to using this live platform. Let us worship God together. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. My salvation comes from God. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. My hope is from God. God alone is our rock and our salvation, our fortress. We shall never be shaken. Trust in God at all times. Pour out your hearts before the Lord, because God is a refuge for us. With confidence in God, let us worship the living Lord together.
Please join us now in singing Christ is Alive, hymn number 246 in the Glory to God hymnal. Come to a time of confession with confidence. Not because we are so good that we have nothing to change, nothing that needs God's mercy. We come with confidence because God is great and our salvation comes from God. So with humility and confidence, let us pray. Lord, like Jonah, sometimes we outright refuse to obey, to follow you. Like Jonah, sometimes we take our relationship with you for granted and want you to love the people we love and hate the people we hate. Sometimes, Lord, like Jonah, we finally come around to what you want us to do, but we do it begrudgingly. Forgive us, merciful God, for choosing not to listen for your voice and for pursuing plans and ideals that go against your will for us and for the world. Forgive us when we have bad attitudes and lack kindness and concern for others. Hear us now as we pray in this moment of silence. Amen. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus comes declaring the good news. Thanks be to God that we receive that good news still today, that we are forgiven by God through Christ's work alone.
first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. As we hear the word of the Lord to Jonah, listen now to how God may be speaking to you this morning. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh. According to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on a sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways, and from the violence that is in their minds. Who knows? God may relent and change God's mind. He may turn from his fierce anger, so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hey, young friends, it's time with children. Now, you all know that we have a holiday tomorrow called Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday. Martin Luther King Jr. was a great man, so we have a holiday because he helped our country change rules and change laws so that everybody could be treated more fairly. Now, we still have a lot of work to do, but Martin Luther King Jr. was a great man, and he helped us a lot. I'm going to tell you the story about one of his friends. One of his friends is named John Lewis. When John was a little boy, he grew up on a farm. And on his farm, he didn't like to do very many farm chores. Even sometimes he would hide so he didn't have to do farm work. But there was one kind of farm work that John loved to do. He loved to take care of chickens. And he had dozens of chickens on his farm, all different kinds. And he named his chickens. They were like his friends. He didn't mind at all taking care of the chickens. But he also did something most farmers with chickens don't do. John Lewis would tell Bible stories to his chickens, things that he was learning in church. He would tell his chickens. He would even preach them sermons. And one of his favorite verses of Jesus that he taught his chickens was, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Well, when John Lewis got to be a teenager and a man in his 20s, he still loved that verse. Blessed are the peacemakers. He wanted to be like Jesus. He wanted to help change things and make things better, but he didn't want to be mean. He didn't want to say hurtful things. He didn't want to use violence or fists or guns. He wanted to change things peacefully, and he did that his whole life. Even when people were harsh to him or mean to him, John kept a promise to never be violent, and to always be loving. Pretty cool, 
Martin Luther King Jr. and his friend John Lewis. Both of them love God very much, and they teach us how to be peacemakers. Will you pray after me? Dear God, thank you for teaching us how to be peacemakers. Help us to love everyone and be kind and strong with our words and our actions. Amen. Thanks, friends. Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, continuing on reading in chapter 1, where we left off last week, at verse 14. Listen for a word from the Lord. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can a leopard change its spots? That's one of those maxims where the obvious answer is no. And it's usually offered to say something like, he's not going to change. She will always be like this. Don't get your hopes up. They will never change, so you might as well accept it. When things are tough, and I don't need to explain to you all the myriad of ways things are tough right now, some of us take up the leopard as our mascot. We hunker down, expect the worst, and watch to see if we're right. We live as if we have some kind of crystal ball about the future, and we know that things that are bad will only get worse. A feeling of hopelessness can descend like a rain shower. The two scripture lessons for this morning invite us to think differently, to consider that with God things can change for the better. A leopard can change. A nation can change. A person can change. Even we, ourselves, can change. The Old Testament book of Jonah is not a history lesson or a science journal or a miracle story even. It's a great story meant to be enjoyed, made to make us laugh and smile. And the book of Jonah is a sermon a theological reflection on God and God's love, not just for one group of people, but for the whole world. Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh, a great Assyrian city. And he was told to cry out against all of their evil practices, all of the evil that they were doing. But Jonah didn't want to go. 
The Ninevites were a superpower, and they were Israel's enemy. Jonah didn't want to go, not because he was afraid that they were going to kill him. He didn't want to go, frankly, he was afraid that God might be merciful, steadfast, in love, slow to anger. Eventually, the storyteller moves to the climax of the story, and Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he does the very least he can do and still feel like he did what God told him to do. He warns the people of Nineveh, and then he goes to the outskirts of town. And lo and behold, the people of Nineveh believed God. They repented of their evil ways. Even the king humbled himself before God. He left his throne and sat down on the ground in a pile of ashes as a sign of his repentance. He removed robes of comfort and prestige and affluence and beauty and power and instead put on sackcloth, that unglamorous, itchy, scratchy clothing. Nineveh changed. They repented and humbled themselves before God. The story of Jonah ends with the listeners wondering if Jonah is ready to humble himself and repent. Is Jonah going to change? In the gospel story, we see Jesus launching his ministry. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The first thing he does is to call disciples, to call people to follow him. Now, people who wanted to be a disciple in those days, they usually sought out a teacher, a rabbi, somebody that they chose to follow. But here, Jesus is the one making the first move. Jesus is the one taking the initiative and extending the invitation, calling people to leave what's current, their current life, and to become his followers, become his disciples. It's quite amazing to see Simon and Andrew leaving their nets to follow Jesus. And then, just to make sure that those guys weren't kind of like a fluke, the outliers, like nobody else would ever really do that, Jesus goes and calls two more, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and again, they hear Jesus' invitation, they leave their nets, they change their life, they follow Jesus. They had no clue, really, what they were getting themselves into. We read this story, and we listen to it, and we know what happens later. We know the story of the Gospels and their following Jesus, and what happened with his death and after his resurrection. And we know the story of these disciples and their role in the very earliest Christian churches as the gospel good news began to spread. We know what they were saying yes to. Their lives were changed by saying yes to Jesus. And their faith in Jesus Christ then changed the lives of other people whose change then changed others all the way down to us. Things can change. People can change. And the change can be for the better. Just think of it. We're, we don't live in a perfect time. But think about positive changes that we've seen. We ended slavery in this country. We gave women the right to vote. We overturned Jim Crow laws. We made marriage legal for the LGBTQ community. We've held abusers accountable. 
We've elected a black president, and now we've elected a woman of color to be our vice president. We've begun to destigmatize mental health issues. We have more police officers now wearing body cameras, so when bad and tragic events happen, other eyes can make judgments. We have more women CEOs, more women serving in government. Solar energy and wind energy are now providing clean energy in so many places. You can now plug in your car in some parking lots at grocery stores and other malls. Urban gardening is making our communities healthier. Countries that were once our enemy, like Germany and Japan, are now trusted allies. Vaccines for the coronavirus, which once seemed like a long, faraway dream, are now being injected into arms. Change for the better happens. I've seen it in people's lives. A person's great pride and joy in celebrating two years of sobriety. A new awakening of faith after years of disillusionment or apathy. One caught in an ongoing pattern of infidelity changes and finds healing and establishes a faithful relationship with a spouse. A congregation formed in the 1960s by white people who were fleeing any chance of living in a mixed neighborhood or having their children go to integrated schools now has a deep impact in an immigrant community of refugees, of people of all colors and religions. A Presbyterian church musician, Sue Ellen Page, sought to address inequity for the arts in the Trenton community by starting the Trenton Children's Chorus, teaching young singers music, building self-esteem, helping them prepare for college, and giving them opportunities to travel and to sing and to bring joy to others, including in the White House. A young man who grew up in a home where racial jokes were frequent and prejudice was just part of the air they breathed. As a follower of Jesus recognized he needed to change and it was wrong. And he opened himself and humbled himself and started a ministry with teenagers that brought in people from different socioeconomic levels and with different colors of skin. Change can happen. We've seen it. I've seen it. You've seen it. God calls us to turn around, to change, to follow Jesus, to be changed. Eugene Boring and Fred Craddock, in their commentary on Mark, commented on those first fishermen, Simon and Andrew and James and John, and their yes to the invitation of Jesus to be changed. And they wrote, in reality, this is the first of Mark's miracle stories in which the power of God changes human lives. We, the church, we are a community of Jesus' disciples. We are a community of people whose lives have been changed by God and whose lives are being changed day by day by the grace of God. Part of our calling, as Presbyterians like to say, in the great ends of the church, is to promote social righteousness and exhibit the kingdom of heaven in the world. Our job as disciples includes being a transformative agent of change, of positive change in the community and in the world. We are invited to be that, right where we are right now.
so that our ways of relating to each other at a personal level and as a society, as a nation, will better reflect the love and justice and peace of God. Never despair, friends. God isn't through with us yet. We can change. We can be changed. And we can take up a discipleship work for change as agents in God's kingdom. Amen. Let us affirm together the great ends of the church found in the Presbyterian Book of Order. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for salvation and humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Please join us now in singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, hymn number 339 in the Glory to God hymnal.
that we are knitted together into one body at all is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And yet, as the great ends of the church remind us, the church does not exist for itself alone, but for God and for the world. We are not only embraced by God, we are called to exhibit the kingdom of heaven to the world. We are called to show that change for the better is possible. And we do so by investing our talents, our time, and our tithes in the ministry and work of the church. During this time, we continue to have two options for giving your financial offering. You may mail a check to the church, or you may go to the website and click the Donate Now button. The process is simple, safe, and fast. Thank you for continuing to give financially, for living out your baptism as a disciple of Jesus Christ, for sharing your time and talents, for praying, and for living your faith at work, school, and at home. Teach us to turn swords into plowshares 
Teach us to unlearn and challenge racism and to love our enemies as you love us. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is, Today we are all called to be disciples. Uh, hymn number 757, in our glory to God. we have been called as disciples by God's grace, changed by God's grace. And we are invited to be agents of change for God in this world. So go forth wherever you are this week to be that agent of change. And you'll do so with the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>